for those of us who prescribe long-acting opioids. But before I start, Dale Bishop from the Alliance wants to make a few comments about buprenorphine and uh, Medi-Cal. So here, very important. So ears up. Thanks, Jen. I just want to um, just make sure that everyone um, understood how I'm understanding this at this point and before people start prescribing um, Suboxone buprenorphine um, without the uh, license provision to do that, we need to make sure that the Medi-Cal system is going to let those get filled because my, now buprenorphine Suboxone is carved out to Medi-Cal fee-for-service, so the Alliance doesn't really have much jurisdiction over those prescriptions. So right now I know that if people have a license provision to give it, that they get, the fills get filled, but I'm not clear if you don't have it that DHCS is honoring those, those um, prescriptions. So we are going to do the diligence. We actually already have the question into them to be sure, but um, yeah, Bill, maybe you well, know. My question too is, let's say you have the license, you know, maybe I'm just getting this special kind of license, and you give it to someone, but it's not, you're not giving it to them for a uh, diagnosis of addiction. Can you get them in trouble for that? Yeah, my impression is that People are getting it filled now for because it, you know, I think I don't think you have to have the diagnosis of addiction to get that filled on Medi-Cal, but we're going to check that also. I, I write my special number. Right. Is that implying is that implying that I'm giving it for addiction? Again, these are all really good questions, and this is what we want to clarify before we have people really working on this too much. Um, it should hopefully be a relatively quick answer, but it's really an important one before we really open this up and really encourage everyone to do this. I, I went to a, there was a medical director's meeting in July at DHC in Sacramento, and they said they really want to encourage PCPs to prescribe Suboxone, and they put it in the context of reducing doses. They didn't say addiction, they didn't say pain, they said we want doses reduced, and we think Suboxone is the right way to do it, and they said plans need to help providers get the special provision on their license and the training to do that. So. That's the context that I'm hearing. So I'm hearing that they would allow it for more than just addiction. They would allow it for pain, as long as the, the intent is to reduce dose. And there may be, though, this provision to need the licensure. Uh, so uh, we need to get back to you on that before anybody's. I don't want people. I really don't want people to walk out of here frustrated, writing for this, and having something denied. That's that's, that's the worst scenario. That's not my understanding. That's not my understanding. My understanding is that. My understanding is one, you need the certification, and two, that payers will not will not cover that Medi-Cal Medicare will not cover for the use of Neltrex um, for the use of uh, buprenorphine or Suboxone for anything but but the treatment of addiction and not maintenance either. This has to be so. So I appreciate so that, get back and, to and that may be, and that may be what um, the truth is. But that's not what the DHCS um, medical director, Dr. Katsu, said in July. So we will get back to you on that. But I appreciate um, the caution with this. I don't want people again to get frustrated trying to uh, prescribe this for other other things. I think certainly it's okay for pain, for addiction. Um, I think again, the state wants to have people reduce doses, so they seem to be having some. Um, let up on that requirement, but we'll find out for sure and get back to you all. Okay, so the other point is that you'll have to educate your pharmacies, because I do prescribe those things, and a lot of the pharmacies say, oh, you can't do this. Cedra. So just say that. You have to educate the pharmacies that you prescribe to, because a lot of them won't take those prescriptions without the number, because they don't know what the rules are, and they're uncomfortable, and it's pharmacy, to, I mean, it's, it's pharmacist to pharmacist in the same pharmacy. Okay, very One patient that I have given buprenorphine to for pain told me that the pharmacist actually wrote my X number on it right. himself, where I hadn't written it because it wasn't for. So uh, clearly this is complex, and we're in a turning point, I think, uh, in the state, because if at the Medi-Cal director's meeting, that is Medi-Cal, and if they're telling people to start prescribing, then there's going to be maybe a delay when the state, you know, sort of gets its act together to respond to the change in appropriateness of prescribing. And I think we got good evidence that it's appropriate. Now we just have to have the state uh, get on board. 
So I'm going to try to move quickly through the slides so we can get to the questions. Uh, naloxone, which we know as Narcan, has been used for decades to reverse respiratory depression. And it has a very strong affinity, and we had a good discussion about affinity for receptors, but it does have a stronger affinity for opioid receptors than narcotics, and that's why it works. It is not a controlled substance. It doesn't get folks high, and if you give it to someone who actually is not on opioids, it will do nothing. It won't hurt them. Now, the, I, the reason maybe we have all these N-words, there's Narcan, Naloxone, Naltrexone, and even though I was doing this for a while, I was getting all mixed up with the words. So I wanted to spend a few moments. And they have very similar chemical structures, biochemical structures. That's why they work in the way they do. And we have Naloxone or Narcan, and this is the structure. Uh, that is not the structure. That was in the slide before. This is the structure for Naltrexone. And I was getting all mixed up between Naltrexone and Naloxone. And I figure if I was getting mixed up, maybe some people here were too. So Rivia is the, bland, the brand name, and Vivitrol is the one-month um, intramuscular preparation. And naltrexone has competitive binding as well and blocks the effects of opioids. It does not work like delsulfiram, and it is used and has been used for years for alcohol and opioid dependence. And it appears to have some analgesic properties as well. But that's all I'm going to say now about naltrexone, because we're going to go on to look at naloxone. And we had a very interesting conversation with Andrea before, um, in preparation for this meeting. And Andrea, in Andrea's practice, she doesn't use naloxone. In her patient population, she doesn't see that her patients are at risk. But in the safety net clinics, and probably for a lot of our patients, there is some risk. And there's good evidence that people are dying, and so we need to do something. And um, I had the pleasure of hearing about the work of Philip Kaufman, who um, has come to San Francisco and really done an amazing shift in San Francisco. They did a study, I think it started a number of years ago. The study will be published in a few months, and Philip was not able to give me all the information about the study because it's not been published. But basically, they did qualitative interviews with patients and had a penetration rate of about 40% of patients on long-acting opioids were given naloxone. And what was interesting is when they did those qualitative interviews, what they found is that people did not see themselves at risk of overdose. The word overdose to them meant shooting dope or swallowing a whole bottle of pills. And even a patient who was in the ER 15 times, given Narcan 15 times, had the self-perception that he was not at risk for overdose. This is stunning and something that we as providers need to be aware of. What he said was, this was a side effect of his medications. It was not an overdose. So, in the preliminary data that Philip was able to share with me, he said, what was so powerful about the naloxone prescription was that there was a shift in awareness on the part of the patients that the opioids might not be safe. Turns out we've been prescribing them for years, but not really going into the safety issues. So what naloxone does when you do a prescription is that it opens the conversation. You now have a dialogue. And patients begin, and this is according to Philip, they began to think about alternatives. Well, if this is dangerous, what else could I do? And so the things that we've been sort of proposing over the last few years as alternatives to opioids became more interesting to patients. And this is data from Salem, Oregon, um, and also Staten Island, New York, had the same kind of data, that the decrease in deaths were not because patients were actually using the naloxone, it was because they changed their behavior around their opioids. And I think this is just fascinating. And now we see naloxone as an agent for change in behavior. So this is from Philip's uh, PowerPoint where he looks at these two different possibilities. Do you basically give your patients, all your patients, regardless of your perception of their risk, do you give them a prescription for naloxone and have that conversation? Or do you try to figure out, do a risk stratification and say, hmm, is this patient at risk? Or ask the patient, do you think you're at risk? And it's less costly to the state, I guess, if 
we don't give a prescription to everyone. On the other hand, if they're in the ER, even once, that's way more expensive than a pr uh, prescription for naloxone. And you might argue it's less work for you to not uh, write a prescription, but, you know, what's work? Okay, so I think on the other side is that it's simple to remember. We're not very good at predicting risk. And, in fact, patients don't perceive that they're at a risk, so you basically have a different kind of conversation. And um, this is, I'm not going to go through this slide, because all these slides, by the way, are going to be on the HIP website. But these, if you were going to stratify, this is, these are the patients you might say, okay, I'm going to give you a prescription for naloxone, because in our conversation together, we think you're at risk. But instead of talking about overdose, let's think about different language, and we've learned a lot about language from Elizabeth today, but let's talk about opioid safety or a bad reaction. So here's some uh, offerings for how you might talk about it. Opioids can sometimes slow or even stop your breathing. So here's a prescription that your loved one can give to you. So obviously if the person is uh, in respiratory depression and not breathing, they can't give their own dose of naloxone. They have to educate their family and friends about how to do that. Naloxone is the antidote to opioids to be used if there is a bad reaction when you can't be woken up. So that's another suggestion. Or naloxone is, an opioid naloxone is for opioid medications, like an EpiPen is for someone with an allergy. So that's another uh, offering. So in your packets, you have these orange brochures. This small one is for you to provide your patients, and we'll figure out a way for you to get, get them. Or actually, you can order them. There's the, um, the email on there. And then this larger pamphlet is for all of you. So this is what's on the small one. And these pamphlets can be used to educate your patients. You can basically use this while you're talking to them. And you can bill for this as part of the expert billing. Um, and I won't go into that right now, but these are the steps. If you ident and this is what you're going to walk through your patient with, and these steps are in the little brochure. Call 911 and give naloxone. Do rescue breathing or chest compressions. And then you have to stick around, because naloxone um, basically doesn't last as long as the long-acting opioids. So you can't just give them naloxone and walk away. You need to get them to medical care or stay by them. So um, in preparation, well, actually not in preparation for this, I um, am part of an opioid safety group. And I decided, well, I should start prescribing opioids for our patients on long-acting opioids. And turns out, it's actually kind of hard. First of all, I didn't know how to write the prescription, and that is in your pamphlet. So when I learned how, then it turns out most pharmacies don't carry it. And so just what um, Dr. Frank was mentioning in terms of communicating with pharmacies, we basically have to embark now on a basically all-out effort to say to our pharmacies, you need to carry this. So there's a statewide mandate from CVS that all CVSs carry this, but our CVSs don't yet, so there we are. And there are two preparations, there's the, actually there are three, but two that are really available to us are the injectable naloxone. You can also, if you get too frustrated, you can go to Janus, and this is the, um, what's available, the packet that's available at Janus, and it contains two vials of naloxone, and two syringes with needles, and some instructions. And these are free, however you are welcome, or your patient is welcome to give a donation. If you want to buy a whole bunch for your clinic and just to, you know, hand them out, that might be the way to go at this point until we get our pharmacies on board. The one pharmacy that is willing to do this without a question is Horschneider's. And I believe Watsonville Pharmacy as well, in, in uh, Watsonville. The other preparation is intranasal. At this point, that is still off-label. Yes? I just have one question. I have an updated Hippocrates, and it says Alliance doesn't cover this. That's so. correct. Be oh, let's see. That's right, because it's state. It's state Medi-Cal. It's the same issue as Suboxone. So this is considered for addi addiction, not for pain, even though that's not true. At the current time, state Medi-Cal will pay for it. And I think my next slide is a perfect lead-in 
This will give you the NDC numbers that you can offer to the pharmacy, but you have, it's state Medi-Cal that will pay for it. So if you have an Alliance patient, they have coverage both through the Alliance and then they have state coverage for things that are carve-outs. So that would be addiction. Yeah. So just backing up, the intranasal preparation, which is the lower slide, is um, much easier and or more palatable probably for family members and for strangers to just squish the naloxone up the nose. Unfortunately, that is, um, the, the medication is covered, but the nasal um, atomizer, the little adapter thing, that is not covered because there's no NDC number for it. So you have to call, and I gave the 1-800 number that you can call to order them. Um, one slide or one reference said they were $3, another said they were $5. Some communities have gotten together and just bought them. Um, we could go to the Community Foundation, for example, and write a grant and say, you know, we need the nasal adapters. Yes? Can you order these via e-prescription, or do they require special handwritten um, You know, they're not a controlled substance, so I would think you could. But you need to call the pharmacy because, most, as I said, Horschneiders would be the only one at this point in Santa Cruz and then Watsonville. And for Monterey, I don't believe we found a pharmacy yet. So, What was that? Oh, wonderful, Ordway, they're great, good. Okay, so it's still a challenge. Um, so this leads me to sort of community models for collaborating about reducing opioids. And indeed, naloxone is uh, a reasonable approach as a community to get together. And so um, we're very, very pleased that in Santa Cruz, we wrote a grant to the Community Health Care Foundation and got a grant to reduce opioid deaths. And in the process of writing that grant, we came together. Bill, do you want to come up and talk about our collaboration on reducing deaths? So I already mentioned how Staten Island has reduced the deaths by 32%. They got police to all carry the naloxone, which is one intervention that I think would be a good idea for us. So this is your moment. So I'll just quickly describe what we're going to be moving forward now with in the next 18 months with this grant we got from the California Healthcare Foundation. And it's for Santa Cruz and Monterey and Merced. Santa Cruz, okay. So Santa Cruz, we, we applied for the grant under the concept of we need to define what opioid failure looks like. Because we really can't deal with something unless we know what it looks like. And so the first step of the grant will be to gather together all interested parties and stakeholders and come up with a working definition of what opioid failure is. And of course that's going to take into account dose, how long patients have been in medicine, but we want to make it as workable as possible. The second phase of the grant will be then to say, how do we make sure that patients for whom opioid, chronic opioid therapy appears to be working, that they get, still have access to chronic opioid therapy, and it's done in a safe, monitored way. The other flip side of that would be, for those that opioids appear to have failed, how do we then recognize them based on that definition that we've come up with together, and how do we manage chronic opi or opioid failure? So the third part of the grant will be um, coming together as a community and a coalition and deciding how we're going to develop opioid failure management resources. So um, it's sort of, uh, in some ways, what Dr. Rubenstein has done and, and Kaiser, um, they deal with a lot of these opioid failures for their Kaiser organization. But we need to develop a way to deal with it for our community in a way that everyone has access. So not just Medi-Cal patients, but private insurance patients, PAMP patients, PMG patients. So that's what we're working towards, and we, it's a big task. It's a, a year and a half, we have to do it, but we want to come together as a community to, to do that. Thank you. That's great. And an, another thing that's been available for a few months is at Janus, we have something called the Options Program, which if you identify patients who are, um, you don't think that they're doing well on their opioids or you're concerned about their dose. If you have a, a patient who's uh, motivated to be involved in that process of figuring it out, you can send them to uh, Dr. Bill Morris at the Janus uh, Center. And um, I think we'll also have on the HIP website information about the options program. So I, th I see this as a really important resource. I've been frustrated a lot of times with patients where I feel like I'm not doing the right thing, but I don't want to send them to an interventionist. It's not appropriate. I don't think for them to get, you know, lots of procedures, but I want another eye at this patient. And I'm so... We'll be able to manage the evaluation. And then part of that program is yep. a week of getting patients off. Part of, that, part of the 
program would be weaning, and then part of also would be the option if um, addiction is identified to to transition them to addiction therapy. Treatment. Perfect. Great. So. The other update that I wanted to give people is that we had a date of January 1, 2016 when everyone had to be registered with Cures. And because they've had you know, a, one lonely person <laughs> in this, at the state uh, registering everyone, they have extended the deadline to July 1st, so that's good news. In addition, they're working on an online registration process that will be called Cures 2.0 and they're piloting that right now, and so I would say in a month or two that should be ready for real time. So that's good news, and so now we get to move on to our questions. So I don't know where Andrea is, is she in the? Oh, there you are. So how do, I think that table's kind of off-centered. How about if we just come here and have the two of you sit, Okay. and then I have, so I mentioned that, um, I can take, turn that off, I think. Um, A lot of you sent in great questions and cases, and they sort of bunched into um, a couple sections, and I thought I would open up and kind of pull together a number of the cases and then have both Elizabeth and Andrea uh, comment. And we have two mics going around. As you noticed, we had a little feedback problem, so we'll be playing a bit on how to uh, reduce the feedback. I'm thinking turning this one off while the question is being answered might, no? That doesn't help? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Won't do that. No, yeah. Okay, so the most, I'd say we had about 12 to 15 questions that came in, or cases that came in, about people with chronic low back pain on opioids and what to do. And do we still keep them on those, on the Norco? And there was a great comment from someone how Norco is the new Advil. I think that's a great quote. Um, so, okay, so I have like 12 cases, people of varying ages who were put on uh, Norco, or they may now be on OxyContin, and their main complaint is, is the chronic low back pain. You can add in shoulder pain. You can add in um, the pain of life. You can add in they're addicted to, well, so other substances. They use marijuana. They have a, uh, an abuse history, probably more common than not. What do we do right now? I feel like what I heard from you in your talk was that there's no evidence for the use of opioids in chronic low back pain. So do we, what do we do? Do we s sort of slowly take everyone off? What are your thoughts? Let me talk about the 4-Norco guy. Somebody wrote one of the cases. Patients on 4-Norco, that's probably the most common prescription I see. 120 Norco a month, four a day. Um, and we're talking about low back pain. So <clears throat> what I usually do, the, the, if it's just for Norco, and you run them through the, you know, really assess their risk, you check their testosterone, you check their sleep, and everything looks okay, I don't have a problem with leaving them on 4-Norco. The risk is not huge, you know. Now, what I can tell you is eventually 4-Norco will fail because how did your patient that's on 8-Norco get on 8-Norco? They got on 8-Norco because 4-Norco stopped working. So here's where, you know, and I'm going to then um, ask for a little help on how to have this conversation but because I feel very unskilled. Uh, at this point, but this is the way I have the conversation. I say, okay, um, there's no evidence really that this is a good choice, but I see that you're on it, and you're telling me that this works really well for you, and that you're able to do everything, and you're not missing work, and everything's good. Um, and again, it, Kaiser has a funny ulterior motive about people not missing work, because that's how they keep their health insurance. <laughs> so, I mean, full disclosure, you know, disability is bad, but we really want people to stay able to take care of themselves, and I think we do have a little bit of a secondary gain there, but I'm, I'm, I think that's perfectly fine. So, how about if we leave this the way it is? But this drug is gonna fail eventually. And we know that because you started on for Vicodin, you know, and then that went to six, and that went to eight, and then that went to four Norco, and you know, 
So I can tell you that eventually this is going to stop working. So my recommendation at this time, while it's working, is that you start to do exercise and we can help you. We've got physical therapists. We can help you with an exercise program. I can give you all kinds of suggestions while it's working because I promise you it won't. And kind of you already know that, right? Because what happened to the dose you were on two years ago? I will leave you here and I will keep this prescription going and I will be on time. I won't make you wait, but you can't get it early. And when this dose fails, we have an agreement that instead of going up, we'll taper you off. But it's very hard to talk about tapering a drug that a patient thinks is highly effective. Now that's different if they don't think. They're already here and they're like, Doc, I'm on four narco. I really think I need eight. That's a different question. But the patient that's on four and doing well, it, it's a losing proposition to try to taper this patient in terms of the your time is an incredibly valuable resource, and I think you get bigger fish to fry, and, and I think we work on the dangerous stuff first. So I leave those patients, the four Norco patients, alone until the drug fails, and then I taper them. I love how you would have handled that. <laughs> I think that's great. I wish you were my doctor. <laughs> Um, there's just a couple things that in your example I just want to point out. One is um, forecasting. Is that a word that's familiar outside of the mental health field? Forecasting is predicting for the patient what's coming next. And we do it with kids too, right? We do it in, in parenting. And um, so what you're doing is you're forecasting the failure, and um, which is super, super helpful for patients. Even forecasting the end of the visit is super helpful to patients. We're, you know, so we're, we have about five more minutes and then we're going to end, right? So at any time we can forecast for the patient what's going to happen. So if we can forecast a, a failure, that's super important because um, it, doesn't, it doesn't then sneak up on us and all of a sudden it feels like their failure. And the other thing you did is you blamed the medicine. So you didn't say, you know, this won't be enough for you soon, which is then it's about the patient. You said this medicine will fail you. And so I think that's very, very helpful. Anytime we can talk about the medicine um, being a failure. And then the other thing that you did that is one of those communication things that I think is really, really um, helpful is that you essentially set a boundary. Like you forecasted and then said, we're not going to be able to increase it at that time. So anytime we can forecast and then let people know ahead of time, just like when we have care agreements, Sometimes in organizations we have care agreements, but they're really unevenly enforced. And so just like in any family system where there's rules are all over the board, patients are then shocked when they're discontinued after being positive for alcohol a bunch of times in a row, which is super unsafe and scary. But they're shocked because their buddy who goes to see Dr. B across the hall didn't get, right? And so, so I think any time that we can be really clear, like here's the boundary, unfortunately we won't be able to we won't be able to go up anymore on this, then you're kind of on the same team. So, so when that happens, we'll be, able to, we'll, we'll be able to be on the same team figuring out what to do. Um, the only one thing that I would add um, is you guys all probably know patients typically do not know the difference between um, dependence and addiction. And they certainly don't. So whether we talk about it as dependence or whether we talk about it as tolerance, it's the, you know, the same concept, the physical. Um, tolerance and so sometimes if we say to a patient eventually you'll you know you didn't say it like this if, if we say accidentally eventually you'll need more they'll say oh no 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 I don't have addiction I'm not gonna develop a problem with this because they don't know that we're talking about tolerance and so sometimes that becomes really important with patients I'm sure many of you do that all the time to say oh no 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 this isn't about you this is just about the medicine <laughs> this medicine has a side effect of creating physical dependence and that's you know that doesn't have anything that, that, that's different than addiction, you know, to make that distinction for them. Can I, can I just say, I think one of the things that brings tears in an encounter with me is my saying, looking them, at them and saying, I don't think you're an addict. There's no evidence in your chart or from what you've told me that you're an addict. I think you're dependent, and everybody gets this. This is not you. This is everybody gets this. It's part of what being on these medications is about. But you know, because they'll come and they'll say, my doctor thinks I'm an addict, the pharmacy thinks I'm drug seeking, blah, 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 and, and it's so important. If you, if you are prescribing for them, you should be able to look at them and say that, because if you do think they're an addict and you're not getting them help for their addiction, then I think that's a, 
gap in care. So I'm really, really clear on the first, and I think it builds a lot of trust. Like, I don't think you're an addict. I want you to know that. Addiction, let me tell you what it is and what it looks like. And sometimes I have to say, do you know anybody in your family who's had problems with drug or alcohol? And almost everybody does. And I say, you know, you know how they lie about what they're doing, how they're not where they're supposed to be, how they say they're not, but they are, how even though they say they'll stop, they don't. I'm like, I don't see that going on here. Like, that's, that is addiction, and it's very distinct from dependence. And I do do a ton of education around this, because there's a lot of shame. And I think if we can eliminate that, that's good. Yeah. Can I add one thing to that? And then, of course, there would be a different conversation if you do think they right. have addiction. Right. Right. It well, would be a very yeah. similar conversation in that, hey, we know you didn't ask for this. Right. <laughs> nobody, get, nobody grows up and says, hey, I'd like to have an a really powerful addiction by the time I'm 30. Right. Um, so we would have a different conversation, the same stigma-reducing conversation, um, when we would say to people, hey, I'm really afraid that I'm seeing some symptoms of an addiction and it's not your fault and I'd like to be of help with that. Um, it's such a shame that, I think you're right, I think people are so relieved to hear that this is dependence and it is important to them and I, I always have this little bit like, it's such a shame because it's not like if you told me I didn't have diabetes, I'd be like, oh, thank you, doctor, for not thinking I'm a diabetic. You know, I mean, it's so, there's so much stigma around addiction that I just feel sad about it that, you know, Absolutely. It is such a relief. Absolutely, absolutely. So I have a quick question about that. So are you able to reassure them on the first visit that you see them? Because I inherit, I mean, like I'm at a new at a health center and I'm inheriting a lot of four no Norcos and eight Norcos mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, and the, the truth is at the first visit, I'm not sure. Right. And are you able, do you have some good, like guidelines for that? So well, I can say in the first visit, I can't make the diagnosis of addiction if it is there. That's going to take some time. So I give everybody the benefit of the doubt, just, you know, but if it is addiction, it's going to, it's going to show. They're not going to keep, it's, you can't keep that hidden. That's going to show up. But again, in a closed system, when, even if they're new to me, they've often, I have their medical records going back 15 years and I see that, you know, there's been no behavioral issues. There's been no early refills. There's no lost prescriptions, stolen prescriptions, dog ate my prescription, no outbursts at the pharmacy because all of that gets, you know, so I have a pretty good idea. And I've always ta also talked to the referring physician oftentimes about the patient. So I might be able to have a better way in, but the, the sure sign is someone who says, I think I might be, a, I, I, th I think I might be addicted or, you know, like that's almost always a patient that isn't addicted because if they were addicted, they would say, look, I'm an addict if they wanted to let you know that. But the patient that's worried that they might be because other people said they are usually isn't because by definition, they're worried about it. Whereas the addict usually thinks they're the one that doesn't have the problem. You know what, I think that um, there are some of these other signs from you know, pharmacies or early refills. We look at some of those symptom clusters when we're looking for some um, clues about addiction. The actual diagnosis of addiction, um, if someone doesn't know they have addiction and they're not telling you, um, so they're not saying that, the actual diagnosis of addiction um, is based on self-disclosure because it's based on them you know, identifying, they have to identify use in spite of consequences, they have to identify role impairment, they have to identify an increase in tolerance. Like they, and so usually accurate addiction assessment and diagnosis is completely based on the quality of self-disclosure, which is completely based on how empathic they feel the person in front of them is. Because self-disclosure goes up when people feel empathized with and it crashes to the ground and gets like nil or evasive when they feel judged. And so um, I just want to throw that out because you have a really, it does take time and you have like a super good shot at it. Um, you know, the more you build that relationship because then the self-disclosures come and that's really quality information to help make a diagnosis. Do you have that conversation on your first visit? A lot of times I do. I mean, I don't, every visit's different. Every patient needs something different. My job's kind of to figure out pretty quickly sort of what I need to tell them to establish a solid working relationship. Because again, what I don't want the patient to leave. I don't want them to go back to primary care. I don't want them to go 
to, to another doctor. I feel like they have their best chance of being treated and monitored if, they, if, they've, if they're at a level that someone thinks they need to see a tertiary pain specialist, they need, they, they need to probably be with me and I've got to find a way to, keep, to hold them there. So it doesn't always happen on the first visit, but it could. It really, it's more art than science. Recently recommended for chronic patients with pain. Okay. Um, to not prescribe opiate analgesics on the first visit, but instead do a good history exam and uh, get records. You know, because we're not in a closed system, so try to get records from. Uh, previous providers, right. op reports, and things like that? Well, certainly, patients need, you need past medical records. Um, the, the issue is, let's say someone is new to your system, and they're on something, and the, their doctor has kindly done the right thing and said, I'm gonna cover you until you get an appointment with your new doctor, and patient says, I have my appointment on November 9th, and so they have enough meds till November 9th, and now it's November 9th, and it falls on your lap. So it doesn't always work out quite so clean. Now, if you have a patient who's opiate naive and you're thinking about starting, I do think it's worth taking your time, but sometimes you don't have that luxury, and you have to give them something. Um, but I usually want to, you know, I know a p new patient is coming, and if they're coming from an outside doctor in the community, I want to have had a talk with that doctor ahead of time. So my staff knows, you know, get them to sign a release so that Dr. Rubenstein can talk to Dr. Jones and find out what the deal is. It's more valuable than, you know, six inches of old records that, you know, is I just want to say, hey, you know, tell me about this patient, tell me about, and... And that's often the most important thing, and it takes five minutes, but it does, because of HIPAA, it requires a couple extra steps. I, I totally hear you. I can't tell you how, this is like probably the most common question when I'm out in the world talking with people about setting up chronic pain management programs, this is probably the biggest, one of the biggest points of contention, is organizations want to make decisions that there are no opiates on the first visit, no matter if they're on them or not. M many organizations have gone that direction that I've seen, and then there are other organizations that decide, no, that's really a harm done and a little bit of a rigid stance. And but I, I guess I just want to say, I, I do think it's a tough decision. I think that it's incredibly important for the whole organization to have the same standard. Like that piece, and those are hard conversations to have because not everybody agrees about this, and there are really strong feelings on either end. Having though different physicians doing different things in the same organization creates, quite frankly, it increases escalations. And so the staff are the ones who suffer the most because the more differences you see in pain management protocols, the more you see escalations um, rise. And so regardless of how hard the question is, that's my encouragement is just that it's the same. And in some ways, because you have such an activated community engaged in this discussion, I think in some ways it would be ideal to have the community make decisions around that. Um. I think also now that we have access to cures, you can see if they actually got whatever they got last month. And you can see, and so if you can see that they've been filling monthly, 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 and they're at least dependent on that, I think you've got to give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, you got to like your patients, you really do. I mean, if you think everyone who's sitting across from you is lying to you, you need to find another line of work. If you think patients are mostly telling you the truth and are doing the best they can, um, you're going to be much happier in your job. Are you going to get lied to sometimes? And yes, you are, you are. But do you want to make it, you know, it's like you can have an error of omission or an error of commission. and. Um, I don't want to withhold treatment for somebody who's 
even if I don't agree with the treatment, I will usually do it short term while I figure something out. But I don't leave people hanging. Yeah, I don't. I don't leave them hanging. So let's see. Do we want to go with, okay, go for it. I listened to your commentary and, and taking everything in the aggregate that I've heard said all day long, my sense in, in listening to everybody talk about this is that we're kind of preaching the converted a little bit, and this does not happen in a vacuum. The whole reason right now there is this opiate crisis that exists is because forces exogenous to the practice of medicine interfere. The Joint Commission in 2000 identified pain as the fifth vital sign and said physicians were undertreating pain. Didn't address the relationship with pain, they didn't address the neurobiology of pain, they just said you were undertreating pain. And around this room, I'm no show of hands, but I doubt we have any judges or members of the Department of Justice or any of the other organizations that are overseeing opiate therapies in this state. It is criminalized. It's not medicalized, if that was even a term, because the Cures Database is owned by the Department of Justice. It's not owned by the Department of Health. No, that's true. Our licensing with respect to prescribing of opiates is owned by the Department of Justice, not the Department of Health. Part of what I think should happen out of this dialogue is a much broader based conversation with the community at large and saying we need to re-examine how we look at prescription of medications in general, addiction, dependency, on a whole host of levels. But we shouldn't be criminalizing it, which is where we are right now in this state. And I think you, you bring on a, a much larger conversation, which I think when you, when you say it's focused on the, on the patient, to some degree you're right. But I think the terms that you actually talked about in your conversation was, no, it's focused on the relationship. Let's recognize that healthcare is a relationship-based business. And really what we're focusing on is the relationship we're able to build with the patient, the trust and the empathy we're able to rebuild with that relationship, and make sure that the, the relationship is what we actually center our care on and how we care for that person across the table, but also recognize we carry biases with us. We carry our own experiences, and those actually come to the table into play also when we're, we're treating these people. We don't live in a vacuum. Sure. And I think that's really important mm -hmm. in terms of how we approach this problem individually, systemically, and culturally. Right. I agree. In fact, I'm very picky about language. I have corrected more doctors, including calling them out publicly, for using the word narcotic. That is not a medical term, any more than poop is a medical term. <laughs> that is a law enforcement term, and it refers to drugs that are obtained illegally. So when you say, my patient is on narcotics, whether you know it or not, you are, you are implying that this patient there's, there has, has broken the law. So we prescribe opioids, they are not narcotics. I don't care what the DEA says, that's a law enforcement arm. But I think language is really important and I'm very careful about the language that I use with my patients because I do think it matters. So I agree 100%. Um, we made pain the fifth vital sign because it was undertreated. Then we overtreated it for a generation. And now what are we doing? We're snapping back hard and we're gonna end up right back where we were. Apparently we didn't learn anything. Um, and part of it's because careers very few doctors are alive now practicing who remember those, I mean, we have a whole new generation of doctors. Well, okay, but, 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 but there are fewer and fewer and there are more and more young doctors and so we don't have a really good historical memory about this. But you touch on something also, and that is there's generational differences in these patients. The juice box generation has a sense of entitlement that they're bringing into the relationship also. The greatest generation are, are those, I don't have any pain at all, Doc. Yeah, my leg's broken off, and, but it wasn't like that in 44 when I was fighting the Germans, right? You have this wide parabola, yeah. if you will, of, yeah. of different patient expectations, right. and part of that, the difficulty, no matter how old you are as a provider, those of us that are dinosaurs, recognize that, that you're trying to meet that expectation where the patient is. Right, right, and so my motto is don't work harder than your patient whatever they are. If they want, you know, I will work as hard as they do. And that's kind of how we end up with a even-ish 
sort of relationship. I have a little, I love, I love what you're saying because you're, you're talking about this huge variation in people's level of tolerance and acceptance of pain. And um, for the behavioral health providers in the room, and I know there's not enough in the community, so it's like I hesitate to even say this, just, just a plug to have the behavioral health providers as a core member of the chronic pain team is a lot of what we do. I see m myself and my therapist colleagues, I only see patients once a week now, see every chronic pain managed patient in our clinic um, and provide treatment for a fraction of those, but see all of them for an initial assessment. And a lot of what we're assessing in the beginning is their acceptance level of the pain. Because the higher the acceptance level of the pain, the higher the functioning. It's directly related to functioning. The lower the acceptance level, meaning like increased anger, it's not acceptable that I'm having this pain. Um, and so that piece that you're talking about, that massive variation that can be, it can be cultural, it can be age, sometimes it's personality, it's temperament, it's, you know, that variation in acceptance level is something that behavioral health providers tend to kind of take on as a primary aim of treatment, is like increasing tolerance, just like we would increase affective tolerance and increasing acceptance of pain. Right. I think that goes with the fact that the data on people who participate in cognitive behavioral therapy, multidisciplinary programs, they do better, but if you ask them on a scale of one to 10, their pain is usually the same. Yeah. So they come in at a seven, they go out at a seven, but they're like, oh, but I'm so much better. Yeah. I'm better, well, what's your pain? It's a seven. So it's, it's, we've made some other change there that is valuable, but can't be quantified always. Yeah, a lot of what you focus on is function in terms of their ability to do things and also alternatives to the medications that you're now going to not give them anymore. And then Kaiser, I work at the VA, so we're a closed system, the third department that we deal with justice and so on. But um, so how do you deal with in your practice the you know, measurement of function and also you know, provide provision of alternatives to their, their opiate medications? And how do you document it so that the next person coming behind you or your colleagues can see that this person has a plan and if I just pick up the chart and I'm gonna look at it, how do I know what the plan is so that we can either encourage the patient or hold them to the standards that you agreed upon? Well, so um, the first question was about non-opioid alternatives. alternatives, okay? I just gave a talk on this yesterday um, and it was one of the most depressing <laughs> talks I ever gave because I knew what the audience wanted. What other drugs can I use besides opiates? But when I actually went through the evidence, looking, really wanting to find evidence, there was almost no evidence for anything except exercise and multidisciplinary pain programs. No matter, I looked at low back pain, I looked at fibromyalgia, I looked at osteoarthritis. There's some evidence for non-steroidals in that case, and there's a little bit for gabapentin and those kind of drugs. But the truth is, on almost all those drugs, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, the side effects outweigh the benefits. So I've never put a patient on gabapentin, say for fibromyalgia, Neurontin, and gone, whoa, look at that response. It always is, uh. Now I gotta think about adding Cymbalta or Effexor, so then I add Cymbalta or Effexor. Uh. Well, maybe we'll add some Topamax now, and then we get it back into the polypharmacy thing. So I just don't think we have a lot of drugs that work very well. But I do think exercise, lifestyle changes, multidisciplinary pain programs work. It's just that the patient has to do them, and that is a paradigm shift. To go to the doctor and have the doctor say, you gotta fix this yourself. I can't fix this, so what are you getting paid for? You're the doctor. It's like, I don't, this is the fix. I'm telling you, this is the gold standard treatment for which there is evidence. If you do this, you will do well, the odds are. And if you don't do this, furthermore, this is probably as good as you're gonna get. But I don't, I don't there isn't a lot of, you know, we do have, for some pain conditions like complex regional pain syndrome, we have some nifty treatments that are highly specialized, but for your run-of-the-mill primary care level, common pain complaints, I don't know, is anybody, I'd like to hear from the audience and see if anybody else goes, oh, I have this nifty cocktail that I use that works really well for anything. I mean, I wanna know. 
Can I point out something that you said as you took patients off their opioids, what happened to their pain? It was the same or better. Or better. It was the same or better. So do you ever sort of think sometimes that your best treatment for chronic pain with patients who are failing opioids is to get them off their opioids? It can be, but patients are so, their narrative about what's wrong with them is so powerful here, and I'd like some help from you on, on this. So they say, I have degenerative disc disease. Look at my MRI. I have disc disease at L1 through L5. So clearly, I'm going to need something. I can't fix that with exercise. I, it's permanent. It's unfixable. I need medicine. Um, I have the, in my arsenal, actually two MRIs, mine and my father's, that are almost always worse than my patients. So sometimes I will actually say, which one of these do you think is yours? <laughs> no, that's my 90-year-old father. Uh, no, that one's mine. Yours is actually the one that looks rather dapper over there. But um, <laughs> we have to help them change their narrative in order for this to really work. But it's not as simple as saying every single patient on opiates would be better taken off. I don't think that's true. I think when I take somebody off, it's because I think they'll be better. But part of your job is to make the assessment better, not better. You know, if you take somebody off four Norco a day, they're not going to be better. They're not. At best, they'll be the same, but mostly they'll just probably be mad. <laughs> so. Okay. I just wanted to comment on the magic cocktail. I don't have the magic oh. cocktail. Sorry. But I have something that is helpful, and, and I, I want to get your feedback on it. And I learned it when I had um, anterior cruciate ligament uh, surgery, which was ridiculously painful. And I thought childbirth was bad. But um, So what I learned and what I tell patients when I see them, I said, is if your pain is gone and you can sleep, that is really important because during the day you have light, you have distractions, you have things to do, you can get your mind off your pain, but at night it's just you and the pain and the darkness and it's miserable. So let's rearrange, and this works best with long acting opioids, let's rearrange your medication. I'm not gonna decrease them, but I'm gonna rearrange them so you get more of them at night so you can sleep and then you need to take less during the day. And so it's the same dose, so they don't freak out, but it's just rearranged. And that's been really helpful for some people. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 60 years ago, uh, I wondered why my grandmother had these green leaves and a big thing, a glass thing with alcohol and rubbed the alcohol on her sore joints. And now we know that there's pain relieving properties to cannabinoids. And, uh, and I don't know how powerful the actual data, scientific data is, but I know that topical medicine does work for pain, whether it's 4% Voltaren, right. which a pharmacist locally has put, you know, one and a half percent was available. He, he put 4% and it, it works really yeah. nicely for, for pain. And, and uh, that and, and topical cannabinoids and uh, there's, there are some things that really do help and patients sometimes are the ones who educate us to that. Right. And for nighttime pain, I think uh, edible uh, cannabis may be something to think about because for some it does people. last longer than almost anything out there uh, unless it's, uh, you know, $100 right. pill of oxy. The problem is, we don't have a lot of basic science. We don't have good basic science going on. And we don't have a lot of good basic science research that looks like it's about to turn out anything interesting on not just cannabinoids, but anything. We do use a lot of topical stuff. And I have a good relationship with compound pharmacists. That's a whole different talk. We can talk about all the different things that you can do topically. But um, right now, they're I am underwhelmed. The best, most promising thing I think that's out there is ketamine. A little bit controversial to put this out there, but we are using that. It's again, it's not something that's I would ever expect primary care providers to do it. But if you have a someone you can refer to, we um, we're having some pretty amazing results with uh, sub anesthetic 
intra intravenous ketamine infusion therapy. It's complicated, but you know, so maybe in five years there'll be something, but right now I'm not. I usually don't even start gabapentin on people are. So, so I'm so sorry, but we're at our, I missed that last comment, but I wanna, um, we're at our time. I wanna thank our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much. So, so I just, I just want to read uh, something that someone submitted, and I'm hoping that whoever submitted it, because I didn't get to see who submitted these things, feels that they came away with something to answer what they submitted. Individuals who are established multi-pain med users who are now faced with a healthcare environment that will no longer prescribe as previously done. Patients feel abandoned and caught in the middle of a change of medical practice. And I think that really says what we're in the middle of. And I'm hoping that whoever wrote that and all the others who feel that, feel that today was useful for them. And we'll be having ongoing dialogue. And we have another pain uh, meeting, I believe February or March, we don't have the day yet, to bring together all the things we've learned for the last two and bring it to a prescribed safe uh, to work with our emergency rooms. So thanks so much for your time. And we'll give you an update on our grant our opioid safety grant. Thanks so much to all of you.